Hello, I'm Toby Walter. And I'm Bob Faris Jr. And welcome to the next part of our lecture in which we're going to review the process of lipid droplet formation and specifically how proteins target to lipid droplets, how droplets expand, how some droplets expand, and the physiological consequences of lipid droplet formation. Now, in the next step, during formation of lipid droplets, proteins are targeted to a surface. So far, we know about two distinct pathways, how protein can reach the surface of a lipid droplet. In one pathway, proteins are initially translated on cytosolic ribosomes uh, to generate uh, intermediates that are possibly soluble. Those often have amphipatic helices, or protein domains that can fold into a helix where one side of the helix is hydrophilic and the other one is hydrophobic. Those helices then can bind the surface of the lipid droplet directly. In a second pathway, proteins are initially inserted into the endoplasmic reticulum and form often hydrophobic domains such as hairpins that reach into the uh, plane of the membrane and, and come out again on the same side that then, in some uh, pathway, can reach the surface of lipid droplets from the endoplasmic reticulum. So we first want to discuss a little bit of what we've learned over the past few years about how cytosolic proteins that contain either amphipathic helices or short hydrophobic motifs reach the lipid droplet surface. And one of the principles that we and others have uncovered in this targeting you know, how do, how do these proteins find the droplet surface from all the other membranes in the cell? So one of the principles is shown here, and this came in our case uh, from molecular dynamic simulation modeling that we did in collaboration with Greg Voss Lab at the University of Chicago. And what Greg's lab did here is model a bilayer, which is shown in the gray and the blue, with gray being the phospholipid head groups and blue being the acyl chains. And in this case, they've inserted neutrolipids, shown in green, or triacylglycerols, in the middle of the bilayer to simulate what would occur in a lipid droplet. And what they found when they ran these simulations is something uh, unique to having the neutrolipids in the bilayer. And that is, it, there's flexibility in the phospholipids so the neutrolipids can poke up through between the phospholipid heads and essentially create packing defects at the surface of lipid droplets. Now this makes intuitive sense because if you just take an oil and shaken it up and put it in water, you see there are droplets and essentially that's one giant packing defect. Okay, normally lipid droplets are coated with phospholipids to minimize these defects, but nevertheless probably all droplets uh, have some degree of packing defects at their surface. Now to study this process of targeting experimentally, we need model systems. So Rashid Tian, when he was in the laboratory, and later Colin Prevost, set up a system in which they generated membrane vesicles known as giant unilamellar vesicles as a model system into which you could incorporate triacylglycerol, here shown in gray. And in this system, you can now form a, a um, small vesicle that also contains lipid lenses similar to what occurs during lipid droplet formation at the endoplasmic reticulum. We can then add proteins to that system and study where they go, to the bilayer membrane or to the droplet. Now in this slide you see an example experiment in which we take an amphipatic helix protein and incubate it with such a system and you can see that this protein binds specifically to the part of the GOV in which the triglyceride lens is bulging from. You can also see rhodamin PE or rho PE here as a marker for the lipids. And you can see that there is a big bilayer membrane that splits up in two monolayers around that oil lens. With such a system, we can now test predictions from our simulations and ask directly whether or not packing defects are responsible for binding. One way to do this is to take a suction pipette to the vesicle and pull on it. As you can imagine, pulling on that vesicle will increase the packing defects because you increase the tension on it. And what you can see in this movie here uh, that Colleen recorded is that as we increase the tension and thus the surface packing defects, more of the amphipatic helix is binding. And conversely, when we release the pressure uh, or the tension, that then it falls off again. On a molecular level, what Greg Vogt's lab has observed here is that during the simulations, amphipatic helices uh, 
bind the packing defects, particularly using large hydrophobic residues. In this movie, what you're seeing is that a large hydrophobic residue of an amphipatic helix uh, type protein in an unfolded state intercalates with the surface packing defect. And what occurs after that is that slowly this pro protein, once it's bound to it, will fold into an alpha helix. The second reaction is on a time scale that's not easily accessible by molecular dynamic simulations. In this process then, what we imagine is that targeting of cytosolic proteins to lipid droplet occurs in several steps. Initially, large hydrophobic residues read out packing defects that are more abundant, more persistent, and larger on lipid droplets than on other membranes. This then in a second step <coughs> leads to the formation of an amphipatic helix. That, in turn, essentially renders this process irreversible because you're not going to get spontaneous unfolding of this protein on the surface of lipid droplets. So one of the questions that arises when we look at how amphipathic helical proteins bind to the surface of lipid droplets is, why do they go to lipid droplets? Why don't all amphipathic helical proteins, uh, why don't they all go there? And why do some go to other bilayer membranes? And obviously, there are probably multiple factors that control this. For example, if there's other regions of the protein that might direct it elsewhere in the cell. But there's a unique feature of lipid droplets that's worth talking about in, as a principle here. And that is the lipid droplet surface is very crowded. The surface of lipid droplets is, uh, is finite and is a crowded place with many proteins that adhere and bind to the surface. And the, what we and, and others have shown is that the affinity of amphipathic helices is important in regulating uh, the composition of droplets. So, for example, those that uh, there's a hierarchy, and those that bind with higher affinity will tend to bind to the surface and kick off the ones that don't bind. This phenomenon of macromolecular crowding becomes very important, for example, during lipolysis when lipid droplets are shrinking. And when they're shrinking, the surface area is getting smaller, and as a consequence, some of the proteins are kicked off from the surface, whereas others remain bound to the surface. And we believe that this is one very important mechanism for governing the bona fide composition of lipid droplet surfaces. It's very well possible that abnormal protein composition happens in certain disease states. Now, how about that second pathway? I mentioned to you in the beginning that proteins can be inserted into the endoplasmic reticulum and then reach the lipid droplet from there. But of course, proteins that just hop in and out of membranes, and there must be a pathway that allows them to go from one membrane onto the lipid droplet. You can see an example in a cell where at uh, conditions where there is no lipid droplets, both the uh, protein and the ER signal overlap. The protein here is labeled in red, and in this case, it's the Drosophila homologue of a metabolic enzyme known as GPAD4. You can see over time, as lipid droplets form and lipid droplet formation is induced, this protein efficiently accumulates exclusively on the surface of lipid droplets. Now, in this experiment, we're looking at GPAT4 in a so-called FRAP experiment, or fluorescence recovery after photobleaching. And what you can see is a lipid droplet that has a GPAT4 enzyme that's concentrated at its surface. And if I run the movie again, what you'll see is bleaching of the signal at the droplet surface. And then you'll see in very rapid order, within a matter of seconds, GPAT4 repopula repopulates the lipid droplet surface, indicating that there's a very fast kinetics on-off rate for this protein to, uh, to be uh, transferred onto the lipid droplet surfaces. So here's the bleaching, and then you see within seconds, GPAT4 is again concentrated on the lipid droplet surface. And that GPAT4, we believe, is coming from the endoplasmic reticulum. So how does GPAT4 get from the endoplasmic reticulum onto the lipid droplet surface? And so we think that this happens via uh, the presence of ER to lipid droplet membrane bridges. Uh, this is fluorescent signal again, and the arrow is pointing to potential bridge between the endoplasmic reticulum and the surface of this lipid droplet. When we look with electron tomography at a droplet such as this, we can actually see what appear to be ER lipid droplet membrane bridges. So this tomogram shows you uh, the endoplasmic reticulum and the surface of one of these large lipid droplets uh, 
uh, where the membranes are coming together and you can see the endoplasmic reticulum is studded with ribosomes and then it comes right up to the droplet surface. Uh, this is color coded here so you can better appreciate the ER having multiple connections where the cytoplasmic leaflet of the ER bilayer is contiguous with the monolayer surface of the lipid droplet. Now we think that this provides the road for proteins to move from the ER to the lipid droplet. But just because there's a road, it doesn't mean all of you have to go and cross that bridge. So one real big puzzle for us has been for quite a number of years is why do all the proteins seem to accumulate on the surface of lipid dro droplets rather than equi equilibrate between both places, which would lead to most of the protein being stuck in the ER because there is vastly more ER surface than there is lipid droplet surface. Now it turns out that all the information appears to be encoded in a small segment that, presum that presumably can form a hairpin. If you, for instance, take the sequence of GPAT4 that just forms this little hairpin sequence, what you can observe in that sequence is two features. There's two hydrophobic segments that are interrupted in the middle by a prolin that introduces a kink and thereby allows the formation of a hairpin type structure. The second thing you can see is that this is an unusual transmembrane segment in as much as it contains positively charged residues, usually excluded from transmembrane segments. In addition, a couple of very large hydrophobic residues such as tryptophans, which are often more oriented to the surface of a transmembrane domain, but in this case are, are stuck smack in the middle. The sequence is important because in itself it is sufficient to mediate targeting to lipid droplets, as you can see here on the light, left side of this graph. After three hours, pretty much all of the protein that just contains this signal is relocalized to the surface of lipid droplets. And it is not just the composition of that sequence, but really the linear sequence, uh, because once we, if we uh, modify the sequence by scrambling it, um, actually this prevents the efficient targeting, even though the physical chemical properties of that sequence remain the same. So the question is then, if this hairpin is all that's needed to mediate the targeting from the ER to the lipid droplet, presumably via these ER lipid droplet membrane bridges, why do they accumulate there? Uh, again, we turn to molecular dynamic simulation modeling uh, in collaboration with Greg Volslab, in particular with Seung Kim and Jessica Swanson in this case. And from there, what they were able to do is take this GPAT4 hairpin and perform molecular dynamic simulations of the GPAT4 hairpin, a model structure inserted either into a lipid bilayer or into a monolayer in which the bilayer has between it neutrolipids, as I showed you earlier. And when they run these simulations, what becomes apparent is that the final most uh, stable state that they observe in the simulations is, is as shown here, is GPAT4 in the bilayer has one conformation and it has a slightly different conformation, conformation in the monolayer. So in the bilayer, as you can see, the proline that Toby described is towards the bottom of the kink of this hairpin. And the two of the positive charges are located near that proline residue and in close proximity to the phospholipid head groups of the bilayer. The tryptophanes that he mentioned are in the middle of the bilayer where their movement is likely restricted somewhat. However, when the same uh, molecule is modeled in the presence of the monolayer neutrolipids, it evolves into a different conformation. And so what you can see here is that some of these tryptophanes, and indeed one of the positive charges, have migrated up towards the surface of the monolayer. The hairpin is closed slightly, and one of the positive residues, R187, remains in the, towards the neutrolipids, but it's solvated by water. And these, this modeling then allowed uh, Jessica and coworkers to calculate the free energy of the different residues within these conformations. And the principle that they identified were that these uh, these different amino acids, and in particular the large hydrophobic amino acids such as the Ws or tryptophanes, find a lower free energy state as seen in this figure when they're in the monolayer uh, with neutrolipids as opposed to the bilayer. And so this gives rise to a model, which again requires further testing, that part of the driving force for the accumulation of such hairpin proteins 
from the ER to the lipid droplet surface is that conformational changes allow them to, when they reach the droplet surface, to achieve a lower free energy state and become stabilized there where there's an energy barrier for going back to the endoplasmic reticulum. So in summary, we told you about two pathways, how proteins can get targeted to lipid droplets. But what's important maybe to note is that this is quite different than how most other organelles acquire their proteome. Most other organelles either use specific lipid landmarks, such as phosphonocytides on the plasma membrane, the endosome, or the Golgi that bind directly to lipids that are only found there, or they use protein machinery, such as the translocon in the mitochondria or the endoplasmic reticulum, that recognize specific sets of proteins via their signals and insert them there. In this case, targeting in both principles is driven by the unique physical chemical properties of the lipid droplet surface. In one case, amphipatic helices directly read out the specific surface structure of the lipid droplets. In another case, targeting from the ER occurs because proteins have evolved unique features that allow them to adopt a lower energy conformation, presumably only on the lipid droplet. So at this point, we've discussed how triglycerides are formed, how droplets are initially formed, and how proteins uh, target, to the end, uh, target to lipid droplet surfaces. The final step we'd like to discuss briefly is how some lipid droplets expand. So in this image, what you can see is the DGAT1 enzyme and, and others of the triglyceride synthesis pathway behave like this. They're confined to the endoplasmic reticulum. So that's the red signal. The green signal are the lipid droplets. However, the DGAT2 enzyme, and indeed also the GPAP4 enzyme that Toby just uh, discussed, uh, have a different property. They start their life in the endoplasmic reticulum, but it appears that they can migrate to the droplet surface, or at least in co ER compartments that are very close to the droplet surface. So this has the effect where you can compartmentalize triglyceride synthesis. Some of it occurs in the ER, but when droplets are busy forming, some of it goes to the droplets. And this has functional consequences. It turns out that when we look, for example, in fly cells, as shown in this figure, that there are two populations of lipid droplets. They all start off relatively small at four to 600 nanometer diameters. One population over time doesn't grow, but the other population begins to expand. And that population is specifically the population in which triglyceride synthesis enzymes are targeted to its surface. And in fact, you can do cool tricks here. You can drive one population or another population. So for example, on your left is a controlled Drosophila cell that has a mixture of both large and small droplets. But if we overexpress the ER-targeted triglyceride protein DGAT1, we create many of these small droplets. If we overexpress DGAT2, which goes to the lipid droplet surface, we can create a larger proportion of the population of these expanding droplets. Now, we told you in the beginning that pretty much all cells can form lipid droplets. And they do that through apparently two different pathways catalyzed by two different enzymes, DGAT1 or DGAT2. There has been a lot, a lot of work by many laboratories over many years studying the physiology of lipid droplets and the role of the specific pathways in human, mammalian, and other physiology. We want to give you a short vignette of how these two pathways um, participate in human physiology. The importance of that is highlighted by the identification now of many genetic mutations in uh, proteins that are either involved, or in genes that encode proteins that are either involved in the triglyceride synthesis, lipid droplet formation, or that are lipid droplet proteins at the end. Examples include, as Bob already mentioned to you, uh, the sapin BSEL2 protein that leads to a congenital lipodystrophy. There are other proteins, such as the perilipin proteins, which are thought to coat the surface of lipid droplets, or CCT, uh, a protein involved in phospholipid synthesis, important for maintaining the emulsification of lipid droplets that are also linked to congenital uh, lipodystrophies. In addition, there are mutations in the enzymes specifically that make triglycerides, and they have been linked to a number of different metabolic diseases. This includes, for instance, mutations in DGAT1. Now, a number of years ago, uh, with Harland Winter, uh, we identified a family that has a congenital uh, diarrheal syndrome uh, due to the loss of DGAT1 function due to a uh, 
uh, compost heterozygous mutation. And what it turns out is that in this, in this family, uh, the kids that have those two mutations cannot tolerate fat in their diet. When they're exposed to fat in the endoplasmic reticulum, the, as the process of triglyceride synthesis is compromised, apparently that interferes with the function of the enterocyte, leading as a consequence to a protein-losing enteropathy, or in other words, a, a very severe diarrheal syndrome in which uh, proteins are lost into the bloodstream. So fortunately, those children can be treated uh, by reducing the fat in their diet, and that was an important consequence of that discovery. If we look just briefly then, what is the function of the storage of triglycerides and energy and lipid droplets? The one obvious example is we do it for energy storage as we started our lecture describing. Um, to illustrate this, we recently have uh, genetically engineered mice that lack the ability to make fat within their fat tissue. So we call these mice fatless fat mice, or in this uh, slide, the uh, adipose tissue DGAT1, DGAT2 knockout mice. And just to show you what happens when you are able to store fat in your fat tissue, you can see here. Well, first of all, if you look at a very small sample of the fat tissue, on your left are control mice, that's the so-called flox allele, where you can see the WAT, or the white adipose tissue, and the BAT, or the brown adipose tissue, and you see it floats, and it floats because it has triglycerides or fats in it. In contrast, if you delete the enzymes that can make the triglycerides, to no surprise, they don't have triglycerides, and uh, they, it gives rise to fat tissue that sinks in solution here. So what are the consequences of that? Well, here's just one example of the consequences uh, that illustrates why we store fat. So if mice that are normal or lack these enzymes in their fat are exposed to the cold for a few hours, this is four degrees centigrade cold, you can see on the left, as long as you give them food to eat, they're fine. They maintain their body temperature just fine. However, if you don't give them food to eat, the, the normal mouse does fine. It maintains its body temperature. But those that lack the fat stores, after a couple hours, they start to become hypothermic and you have to stop the experiment. So this illustrates that you know, we store fat, obviously, because we need to have that fat available for energy, in this case, energy for thermogenesis uh, via the uncoupling protein to maintain body heat. Now, if you look at that reaction, though, it immediately becomes obvious that besides synthesizing triglyceride, the reactions catalyzed by the DGAT enzyme do something else. And that is, they remove fatty acyl-CoA and diacylglycerol from the cells. And that is important because both of those are bioactive molecules that in addition to being metabolic intermediates can also perturb membrane structure and they can act as signaling molecules. And so we now know that the synthesis of triacylglycerol in general appears to pro uh, protect cells from the accumulation of lipotoxic lipids. Particularly, and inconsistent with this idea that synthesis removes lipotoxic intermediates and puts them in a chemical inert pool of triacylglycerol, uh, there is a number of studies from our lab and others that have shown that if we increase the capacity of cells to make triglyceride, this actually leads to a fat tissue but, somewhat paradoxically to your initial expectation maybe, this is protective. For instance, if we overexpress DGAT in the liver, we get fatty liver, foie gras, and when we do that, that liver is actually protected from uh, insulin resistance and the, and the consequences thereof. Similarly, uh, increasing the, the DGAT activity in macrophages actually protects them, uh, or helps protect the, the organism from insulin resistance. And similar observations have been made in skeletal muscle. Others have also uh, overexpressed uh, triglyceride in the heart, and Ira Goldberg's lab has found that under those conditions, the heart is actually protected from lipotoxicity, even though it now stores more fat. So in this lecture, we've taken you through a series of steps. We've talked about step one, how the oils, triglycerides, the fats are made within the endoplasmic reticulum how they initially are released into the ER bilayer. We've discussed some of the machinery which, uh, that catalyzes the formation or the nucleation and phase separation of triglycerides to form lipid droplets, how they begin to bud towards the cyto cytosolic surface. We've talked about how proteins target uniquely to the surfaces of these unusual organelles. 
And we've talked about how lipid droplets expand, finally giving you some examples in physiology. Now, when you listen to this lecture and as we prepared for it, it sounds like there's a lot of knowledge. And indeed, we now know some things. However, to us, lipid droplets are a frontier in cell biology because when we talk every day, what is really striking us is that there is a lot more we don't know than the little things we have now figured out as a field. We still don't understand, for instance, why lipid droplets just go to the cytoplasm and don't go into the ER. And maybe what's more is why in some cells, such as in the liver or the intestinal cell, there is a pool of lipid droplets that can go into the ER and become lipoproteins. We also don't really understand what regulates the size and numbers of lipid droplets in a cell and the composition that is linked to that. Particularly in this case, it is interesting to think about what is the actual capacity and how is the capacity of a cell determined? Why is it a problem if you reach the capacity and why do cells stop uh, storing more droplets? Uh, we also do not really know what happens with the converse process. Uh, the removal of lipids has been well studied by a number of labs uh, in, that have shown how the triglyceride can be metabolized, but we really don't understand what happens to the organelle, where do the proteins go, where does the, the droplet go, and is that the same in all different cell types? Um, and in many cases, we still don't really understand what is the consequence of lipid storage in a particular cell type. For instance, there are a number of cancer cells that are characterized by their, um, by their abundant lipid droplets, such as renal clear cell carcinomas, where the clear cell part indicates as you look at it and they look clear because they have so much lipid in it. Um, a number of laboratories have uh, provided fascinating uh, description of intracellular pathogens hijacking parts of lipid droplets. Uh, that includes viruses such as hepatitis, but also um, uh, intracellular bacteria such as uh, uh, mycobacterium that use lipid droplets either as a fuel source or an assembly platform. We also don't know about, for instance, what lipid droplets role is in the brain. It turns out that the brain has a somewhat isolated triglyceride metabolism from the rest of the body because of the blood-brain barrier, and particularly glial cell under some conditions of neurodegeneration appear to accumulate lipid droplets to an unnormally high level. Nonetheless, we really know very, very little about this. And of course, you probably have noticed as we go through our talk that although we now have some models, much remains to be discovered in how exactly all these reactions occur and what the mechanisms are. Now finally, Bob and I work together and we share um, a lot of our philosophy and science. And I think we both uh, share that we consider the sort of the, the, the things we're most proud of are the discoveries we make, the friendship we cultivate through the years on this, but also the people we've been able to train and we've been fortunate to work with. Uh, over the years, we've had many students, postdocs in the laboratory. Some of them are listed here, particularly focusing on the ones that have generated the data that we've shared with you today. Uh, science is a human endeavor and is not isolated. Uh, for us, this is particularly true as we were fortunate to have many, many collaborators over the years that have provided access to technology, critical insights, a lot of discussion, and it is really what makes our days uh, fun. And we would like to thank all of them here today, in particular the ones uh, that are listed here and that have contributed to the data that we showed with you, shared with you today. And finally, we'd like to thank our funding sources which have made this research possible. Um, it's a, been a fantastic journey together, and I look forward to, to a lot more in the future. So thank you very much. Thank you.